maritime and aviation ac accidents and incidents to help prevent similar accidents in the future. We would like to thank the people of Northland for the support our investigators received at the start of this inquiry. And in particular, we recognise the people of the Ho Kainga from Te Kau and other places. Te Opauri Leda Rahui across the area out of respect for the deceased. And we, of course, acknowledge the sorrow and the trauma suffered by the families of those whose lives were taken in this accident. And we acknowledge the survivors of this tragic accident as well. We've been supported in this inquiry by an investigation team and the chief investigator of accidents, Naveen Kozabakalam, joins me today. For every inquiry, our investigators gather evidence, we, an we determine, we analyse it, we determine the circumstances and the causes, and we reach findings. And we publish a final report to share the knowledge that we've gained with lawmakers, policy makers, owners, operators, workers, regulators, all so that transport can be safer. And this is the document that we're publishing today. I'm now going to hand over to uh, the Chief Investigator of Accidents to take you through what happened. ...of the Commission's findings. The charter fishing vessel Enchanter, with eight passengers and two crew on board, capsized when it was struck by a large steep wave at about 7.50 p.m. on the night of 20th March 2022. The wave rapidly rolled the vessel to starboard, forcing the superstructure and windows on the starboard side into the water. The vessel continued to roll and eventually capsized. During the capsize sequence, the superstructure comprising the main saloon and flybridge separated from the hull. The hull remained inverted but afloat. The crew activated an emergency position indicating radio beacon, also known as an EPIRB, and the New Zealand Rescue Coordination Centre, the RCC, initiated a search and rescue response. The first rescue helicopter to arrive retrieved five people from the upturned hull and other float SAM. The bodies of the remaining five people were recovered after an almost two-day search and rescue operation involving multiple aircrafts and surface vessels. About as likely as not, Enchanter strayed into an area prone to occasional larger waves peaking as they entered shallowing water. When the wave rolled Enchanter onto its side, the force of the water exceeded superstructure design parameters and the superstructure separated from the hull, resulting in capsize. Three of the missing people were alive in the water when last seen by survivors, but were later found deceased. It is virtually certain that one or a combination of the following factors had an effect on survivability. Limited flotation support. Nobody wore or had immediate access to life jackets. The life rafts likely did not automatically deploy. Detectability. Missing people would have been hard to see in the water at night. None of Enchanter's four life boys had effective retroreflective tape and only two had a strobe light attached. The delayed search. There was significant delay in searching for the five missing people while fuel for the rescue helicopter was sourced. And the tragedy is that all of these factors had an effect on survivability. The Commission made 17 formal findings and identified six systemic safety issues in this report. The findings relate to the cause of the accident, the factors that had an effect on survivability, the aspects of search and rescue capability that may have an impact on future search and rescue operations. I'll now hand back to the Chief Commissioner to talk about safety issues in the Commission's recommendations. So we've made some recommendations, identified some safety issues and made some recommendations for Maritime New Zealand. 
Firstly, Maritime New Zealand's system for auditing and assessing the performance of vessel surveyors is not ensuring that they are interpreting and applying maritime laws correctly when surveying vessels. And we've made a recommendation to Maritime New Zealand that it notifies surveyors of current and emerging changes to maritime rules and to clarify where needed the intent and application of those rules. Secondly, there's a risk if all life jackets on board are stowed in a place that might not be accessible in a sudden catastrophic event. And we've made a recommendation that rules or guidance should be made available to surveyors and vessel operators to address this risk. And thirdly, search and rescue operations can be delayed and inefficient in the absence of tracking devices. We've made a recommendation that Maritime New Zealand require commercial vessels that carry passengers outside inshore limits be fitted with an automatic identification system. The Commission's inquiry has also identified safety issues in three areas relating to search and rescue assets, training and fuel availability and all require the attention of the Secretary for Transport, and the Commission has made recommendations accordingly. Firstly, in relation to dedicated search and rescue aircraft for remote operations, lives may be lost if New Zealand's search and rescue response is inadequate and inefficient due to a lack of aircraft that are fully equipped and crewed for extended search and rescue operations in remote areas. The Ministry of Transport should coordinate with other agencies to identify and source air and maritime assets to meet New Zealand's full, safe, full search and rescue requirements. Secondly, in relation to search and rescue personnel, good search and rescue operations depend on on-scene coordinators and the Rescue Coordination Centre engaging in joint training and to the same frameworks and using the same terms. We believe the Ministry of Transport needs to delegate responsibility for standards to search for search and rescue assets and crews and enter service level agreements for provision of search and rescue assets. Thirdly, in relation to fuel availability and its effect on helicopter range, search and rescue operations could be delayed or prevented if search and rescue operations coordinating authorities don't know and don't understand national availability for fuel for extended helicopter operations in remote areas. The Ministry of Transport should identify opportunities for supply and storage of fuel and maintain a database of stored fuel and fuel supply logistics. The Ministry of Transport and Search and Rescue coordinators should have procedures for asking helicopter operators about their maximum range and opportunities for refuelling for sustained search and rescue operations. So, to sum up, this significant report makes wide-ranging recommendations to address major safety issues affecting the marine sector nationwide. And because everyone, whether it's crew or passengers on a commercial vessel or families and friends on a recreational vessel, deserve to be safe. So we're calling for changes to be made for the better in search and rescue, survivability equipment, tracking technology and marine survey professional practice. That concludes the formal part of our presentation and we're happy to take questions. Accessibility of life jackets, the delays in dispatching crews, and the lack of fuel. In your heart of hearts, how confident are you there's a chance at least some of those five men who died could have survived? Well, it's pure speculation as to what might have happened in a different set of circumstances, and I wouldn't like to say, I'm afraid. Okay. So? Oh, I completely agree with that. Right. And so, when you look at the delays those men endured in the water, how would you describe the weight those men endured and how ill-equipped the search and rescue sector is? We've described uh, what we see as issues with the search and rescue uh, sector in our report, uh, and I think the report speaks for itself on that. Are you, are you confident that the Ministry of Transport will take up these recommendations? My understanding is that they've accepted them, yes. Is that Have any of these recommendations already been implemented or have there already been changes along similar lines to what's been 
recommended in the report? Um, uh, look, we, we've raised these recommendations with the Ministry of Transport. Um, um, our understanding is that um, the Commission's job is to raise uh, the pertinent safety issues, um, and this issue is something that the Ministry of Transport will consider along with uh, the SAR Council um, to address. You mentioned that once it was established the emergency was real, there was still no indication this could evolve into a two-day SAR operation with multiple assets. To what extent was the RCC overwhelmed by what was expected of it? We, we wouldn't say the RCC was, was overwhelmed. Um, what, what we're saying is that there needs to be uh, a cohesive um, unit amongst the various agencies responding to a search and rescue operation. At the moment, there are gaps in that system, and we're asking that they be addressed. Are you essentially saying that there's not enough coordination between those agencies currently? What the Commission's report makes recommendations uh, on those lines. So how much water does the skipper say he was in and how much water does your modelling suggest he was in? Our report uh, makes reference to the fact that uh, there's a disagreement between us and the skipper as to where the accident occurred. Uh, we've said that it is uh, as likely as not that it occurred within the 10 metre contour of Morimoto Island. How was it decided who would go on the chopper and what was the condition of the three people left behind? <sighs> That, I think, is an issue you need to ask uh, search and rescue about. We haven't been involved in those detailed questions as to what um, was undertaken um, at that point. If the Enchanter was um, in just 10 metres of water, have you put divers down to look for the rods and reels which the survivors say would be easy to see on the bottom if it was that shallow? And if not, why not? Um. We, we haven't um, done any extensive seabed trawling um, to um, to locate, you know, um, float sam and other other debris from the from the um, the vessel. But what we have um, done is um, we have assessed the drift modelling from the RCC. Uh, we've got detailed information from those involved in the search and rescue around the patterns followed by the hull and um, the flybridge that was separated from the um, the, the vessel. Uh, and based on that evidence, I think there is sufficient information for us to make the conclusions that we have made. The report points to full supply, fuel supplies and fuel availability being a, a major problem for search and rescue operations. Do you have any specific views on where emergency fuel supplies should be stored in remote coastline areas? I think as the Chief Investigator has said, uh, our role is to identify the safety issues, to make recommendations and to make an, and to ask that those recommendations be implemented where fuel exactly should be stored across New Zealand's huge search and rescue uh, area is uh, something that is um, for search and rescue um, authorities to decide. Just to add to that, so how dire is New Zealand's remote fuel supply system for search and rescue crews and how critical is it that we address this now? The issue is about the extended operations that are required for search and rescue in remote areas. Fuel is generally available for, um, tends to be more for uh, hospital and um, uh, medical uh, um, uh, operations. operations rather than extended fuel, extended search and rescue. So what is the difference between how much fuel is needed for you know, an ambulance operation versus what is potentially needed for a search and rescue operation that could take over two days? Is it well, I'd, I'd be speculating, but I imagine a, um, a helicopter being tasked to uh, go from Kaitaia to some other place in Northland and then return to Auckland is quite different from a search over a great, over a large uh, marine area that could go on for hours. How practical and feasible is a dedicated search and rescue aircraft like Australia has in funds that? That would be a question I would suggest you should speak to the Ministry of Transport about. What are the barriers to making crew and resources available in the remote areas? Well, again, I think that is uh, something that the Ministry of Transport needs to consider in terms of taking a coordinated approach, which is what our report recommends, uh, to search and rescue across New Zealand. And was there any one particular 
additional finding that would have um, measurably improved their chances of survival? There's a number of factors that would have improved survivability, as the chief investigator said, uh, not only uh, life jackets, life rafts, um, track and trace technology, uh, as, as well as uh, deployment, uh, faster deployment mm. of um, search and rescue assets. The, the EPIRB, the um, locator beacon, didn't uh, actually, wasn't actually activated for nearly half an hour um, after the accident happened, as so best as we can tell, and so delays uh, al already existed because of that effect. So is there any one particular issue that you think should be addressed first, or is there a number of issues that are I think our um, recommendations all need to be addressed, uh, and as soon as possible. Hmm. Could you just tap into it a wee bit further in terms of, you know, kind of paints the picture of just an eloquent search and rescue sector, could you just describe that sector and perhaps, you know, how eloquent it is? Let's, let's be clear about one point, though. The search and rescue um, teams that undertook this operation did a, a, a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. Um, um, I wouldn't describe the sector as ill-equipped, but what I would say is that there's much to be done to ensure that we have the capacity to respond um, to a major event. So in the grand scheme of things, this is a 16-metre boat with 10 passengers on board, and it seems from this operation that this was at the upper end of capacity and capability for New Zealand, when in fact, in, at any given point, there will be larger vessels with more people and working in rem more remote areas. So we need to be cognizant of that, and the Commission's recommendation is to raise this important safety issue. You made reference to the EPIRB not activating for a half hour, and there's also mentioned in the report of the life raft not activating as expected. Can you go into more detail about what occurred there? Is that part of the surveying uh, recommendation? The, we don't know why the life rafts didn't deploy. Um, they weren't quite the right type, and that's one of the, the recommendations about uh, the surveying issue. Um, as far as the EPIRB is concerned, again, we don't know why it didn't float free as it was designed to do. But we have issued a watch list uh, about technologies to track and trace because they are so important uh, in terms of search and rescue operations. What was uh, the um, TIC's view on the access to uh, life jackets as a result of this? It's always a good idea in, when you go on a boat uh, to be not only shown where the life jackets are, but also to actually uh, try putting them on and to know how to do that in an emergency. Uh, all the life jackets were in a place that became inaccessible uh, when this uh, catastrophic event occurred, and that's why we've made one of the recommendations to Maritime New Zealand that surveyors be asked to consider putting life jackets in different places in a boat to increase their uh, availability during an accident. Life jackets that, uh, are an issue that has been noted on many types of these accidents. How frustrating is it from your perspective that this is an issue that continues to come up time after time with these types of maritime events? It's very frustrating, and we uh, have, as you um, have commented, made other uh, recommendations about the need for life jackets to be mandated in other circumstances. Whether um, all the survivors would uh, logically have been wearing a life jacket at the time this accident occurred uh, is a moot point, um, although we have made a, rec you know, a comment that the person who was um, out at the back uh, was uh, already exposed and outside and would be preferable to him to have been wearing a life jacket at the time. Is this another example of why the government should accept this recommendation and make life jackets mandatory? Well, that's for uh, the Ministry of Transport to decide, but we do think life jackets should be mandatory, yes. Based on the depth this event is believed to occur, it, it's not believed to have involved a roadway. This was really possibly reported or speculated. To take that. Um, the evidence suggests that the wave um, that was present 
um, in the area where we think the capsize occurred was sufficient in height um, to cause the capsize of the enchanter. Whether the height was uh, the height of a rogue wave uh, or not is in some ways besides the point, but what we do know is that if it was operating in this area, uh, then it was capable of capsizing the vessel. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thanks for Thank you.